Star Drive 117.8 You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind Hey guys, how's it going? It's Tuesday, October 11th And this is the Morning Star Drive on 117.8 We're on YouTube, so make sure to subscribe, follow us on SoundCloud And make sure to support us on Patreon. So what is happening on this wonderful and awesome Tuesday? We've got current news from around the world, the practical word study, and of course, Pravi in the media. All right, everyone, how are you doing? It is Tuesday, and I hope you guys are just enjoying this week. Really thankful for all of you joining us here on the Morning Star Drive. So keep liking, keep commenting, want to hear from you guys and see how you're doing. Let's build this community and uh, just really proud of our community more than anything else because people are commenting, people are very open on this platform. And I really hope it's something that we can continue, especially at the time when it's, you know, like right now when it becomes a little bit more chaotic than before, of course, because of the current situation. But uh, I hope that we can become a place where a lot of people can get together, build a community, speak our minds, um, get questions and answers, uh, and, you know, just even commenting on daily life things. So let's build this community more. Um, let's build this community, and I hope that everyone will really, really be able to, like, buy in on this, too. It's been about two and a half years almost. Almost two and a half years since this podcast has begun. We're already getting close to 700 episodes, so that's pretty crazy too. But either way, um, Thursday, guys, just a couple days later, we're going to have our Q&A Thursday, so make sure you get your questions ready for this week. Q&A is one of the most popular segments. Um, well, not as popular as probably in the media now, but it is one of the most popular segments. So I enjoy it too, listening to these amazing questions, realistic questions, questions that people are going through right now, and how would we be able to answer it through the word or through... Uh, our experiences and the wisdoms that we've grown up uh, for me over the last 24 years. Uh, what what are the things that I've learned that would help people uh, understanding or getting through certain situations too? You know, especially yesterday um, during my my opening uh, for yesterday's podcast, I did talk about uh, it's so interesting how we have more Jesus talk now than we did before. And uh, I, I've been thinking about it for a while and it gives me a lot of, uh, I had a lot of thoughts about like, oh, this would be, this is some of the really big benefits of it, even though it's kind of confusing at times. Uh, but there are some big benefits too. So if you want to go take a look at that, go ahead to yesterday's podcast, the opening statements that I made for that one too. All right. Uh, today, it's still Thanksgiving in Canada. It's Monday still here in Canada right now. I know that for you guys in Asia, it is now Tuesday morning. But for us here in Canada, it is Canadian Thanksgiving. Yes, uh, very relaxed and well, I'm going to be super honest with you guys. Um, It's not a holiday for me. (laughs) Like I work for myself, right? I have this podcast. I do the YouTube channels. uh, I I do other different types of work, but I do it on my own, on my own terms. So I am just, uh, it's really, really nice for me, to be honest. I'm very, very uh, relaxed. And I think this is one of the things that a lot of people want to be able to do, right? And it's to work for yourself. Right? It's not working for someone else and like trading your time for money, but it's you doing your own thing and everything comes to you. And I think that's something that a lot of people are looking towards, right? They're looking for financial freedom where they're no longer working for someone else and you want your own company. You want to do your own thing. Take your own holidays. Do the things on your time, right? So uh, I'm very, very happy, uh, especially for myself right now because. Uh, I am, you know, working on crypto, working on investments, working on these podcasts and everything else. And um, I'm really, really excited because I'll be going to Malaysia soon too. And even all that is on my own money. So I'm really, really like excited about that too. Uh, I'm not like, I'm, I'm not saying this in a bad way. What I'm saying is I'm not subject to someone else above me saying, you can't do this and you can't do that kind of thing, right? Like there's no one, sub. oh, of course there's God, but there's no one over me saying, you can do this, you cannot do this, you can't, you can, you can't. Like I don't have any of that. It's just my, this is what I am doing for myself. So I hope it's something that a lot of people do want to talk about later on when it comes to Danny's money also. Uh, or if you have your questions about finance too, use them for the Q and A Thursdays. I think that's a, it's a perfect time to ask all types of questions, not just about Sunstream, the current situation, but also your situation is what about my financial situation? What can I do to make it better? All right? Like, uh, there's just so many different ways that we can make things happen. All right. Uh, today's probably in the media is going to be a really, really good one. Like they say this in, um, 
uh, in the UK, they say, oh, it's going to be a banger, right? It's going to be a good one today. And uh, we're going to go over another article from um, this uh, this person. His name is Massimo Introvigne. And we did one of his other articles before. But he is interesting because he is someone who studied about Providence. Not studying because he wants to be part of Providence. He's studying for scholarly purposes. It had nothing to do with trying to figure out what is right and what is wrong. It's for scholarly purposes. So it's written from a very different, um, unbiased point of view. And it's not from someone who's thinking, oh, this is a cult. Or someone thinking, oh, I got to join this place. Very, very good. It gives you a good view of how people uh, who are unbiased would take a look at us from the outside perspective. And I think it's very, very healthy. He does a five-part series. I'm going to do number four today because he's going to talk about, yeah, it just uh, you're going to enjoy this one, just getting that perspective. And those of you guys don't know, Massimo Intervini, he, he is um, he's a sociologist of religions, right? He is the founder, managing director of the Center for Studies of New Religions, and it's an international network of scholars who study new religious movements, or you know what it's the it's the word for cults, right? But it's kind of like the the unbiased uh, word for it because cults is very negative, right? For new religious movements, and he's the author of seventy books and more than a hundred articles in the field of social, uh, sociology of religion. He's the main author of the Encyclopedia del Religion in Italia, which means Encyclopedia of Religions in Italy. He's a member of the editorial board of the Interdisciplinary Journal of Research on Religion and of the executive board of uh, the University of California Press, right? And from January 5th to December 31st, 2011, he, was, uh, he served as a representative on combating racism, xenophobia, and discrimination with a special focus on discrimination against Christians and members of other religions um, in an organization called the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And from 2012 to 2015, he served as chairperson of the Observatory of Religious Liberty, instituted by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in order to monitor problems of religious liberty on a worldwide scale. So this is someone who's been studying it, going over all the research, and listening, kind of listening to where, from his perspective, it's very non-biased. It is not negative, and it's not positive. So it's, he's not like he's for Providence. He's just going over facts. That's all he is. And uh, I really enjoyed it. So I'll also put this... Um, this article into uh, the description below, but it's a great article, and I loved listening to it, listening from that perspective, that point of view, and I think that's something that we do have to listen to sometimes also, because sometimes if we're just stuck in the Providence mindset, you only think one way, but you need to kind of look from a very broad perspective what other people think on the negative side, and people who are uh, kind of more scholars. What do scholars think about what we preach and what we're uh, about Providence also? So I'm excited about this one for Provi in the media today, all right? I guess oh, my body is exhausted. I played volleyball uh, the other day. We played uh, four games. We won three of them. So uh, we actually went to an open gym drop-in. And so we just play a bunch of other teams. And I'm going to be honest with you. The first two games were just uh, boring because the other team was terrible. <laughs> like, terrible. You know how it is? Like, <sighs> it's boring when you play someone where the level is too far away. And you're like, oh my goodness. It's too, you know, the level is too far away from each other. And yeah, it, it, it wasn't very good. But interestingly was um, uh, when we played from the third and fourth game, I think it was, yeah, third and fourth game, we started getting some good players to play against. And that was really fun. Some of these players are really good. Well, they're not like awesome, but they're like definitely on their high school team. And uh, they hit the ball pretty hard and stuff like that also. So I, I enjoyed playing against uh, those people for sure. And I think that's something that... Uh, um, we have to think about also in our lives too. We just don't want anything to be too easy. And that's that's one of the things where we realize when life is too comfortable, it becomes boring. It really does. You're bored when it's too comfortable. You're bored when it's too easy. Right? That's like when we play like, like even like other competitions like chess or video games. If it's way too easy, man, like no one wants to play. Like, you know, it's like you get so boring that after a couple of games, you're like, nah, I don't want to play anymore. And you'd rather play someone who else, uh, someone else at a very similar, similar level. Right. And I, I hope it's something that all of us will, um, uh, that all of us will really be able to understand that in life, we need challenge without challenge. It's boring without challenge. We don't grow. Right. And uh, I just, you know, just 
I saw it even more yesterday playing volleyball in this drop-in against terrible teams and really, really good ones, all right? So, uh, yeah, that's something that was kind of cool because we finally get to play with our team from the Vancouver Church. Uh, oh, new poll just came out, guys. New poll came out. Guys, take a look at this new poll. I want to see what uh, what your honest opinion was of your um, of yourselves over the last two years during the pandemic. Okay, so what am I asking right now is how was your faith during the pandemic? That's my big question to you guys. How was your faith during the pandemic, right? During the 2020, 2020 to 2022 until now, uh, how was it? Did, was it awesome? Did it get better? Did it get worse? Was it average? Was it really, really bad? Did you skip a lot of services or like, you know, not go to pre -da? Like that's what, I'm, that's what I'm asking is how was your faith? And remember, it's anonymous. You can't see who wrote what, but go ahead, write it down. Um, there's already a bunch of people that have already um, uh, made their votes. So go ahead, check that out. How was your faith during the pandemic? It's on the Morning Star Drive YouTube page. Go ahead, check it out and go to the community section and you'll see that that poll and click, you know, your honest opinion. How was it during the, uh, the pandemic time? Was it better or worse? For myself, I'm going to be very honest with you. Uh, it, it wasn't good for me. Yeah, because I'm a very social person, like very, very super extrovert, as you know. Like, you know, look, I'm doing a podcast and I'm speaking my voice to the entire world. I'm a super extrovert. I want to meet people. But the crazy part was I couldn't meet anyone in lockdown. My mind was going through like the like turning left and right. Uh, my, my faith struggled, during, especially during the first six months, I think, when I was in Malaysia. It was, it was really, really much of a struggle. And then later on, it changed up. But either way, uh, that is something that I was going through. But, you know, be honest with it. Like, I'm, I'm open with mine. I was struggling a lot uh, during that time. A lot of times just trying to figure out, like, I would have a hard time focusing during Sunday service and stuff like that over the online and it, it wasn't it wasn't easy for me. Either way, that's what I was going through. But would love to you know see your the the poll of how people were doing during this time of uh, the pandemic. All right, uh, special with Sky. Yes, uh, that video is still up. Uh, Honest conversation with God. Go ahead, take a look at that. It is uh, when I first heard the news about what was happening to Sun's name. Um, that conversation I had with God by the river in the forest. So go ahead, check that one out too. And I will be, uh, a new video will come out on Thursday, 100%. It's already uploaded. The new video is coming up on divorce and marriage, okay? So make sure you go ahead, support us over there on Espresso Sky too, okay? So let's get uh, let's get this show started with some member music from around the world. So who are we going to listen to and who is our feature artist of the day? It is none other than Mariah Henry from America. And this is one of my favorite songs from her. It's called Universe featuring Cece. And if you go into, she's like the very, very first person I did for the Sunday edition. Go to number one. That is her. And she talks about how she came up with this song, Universe. And it was... um. Uh, she was writing the, the, the music and then CC was doing the piano and they just came together to collaborate and they made this song. I love this song. Uh, so go ahead, enjoy this one. Mariah Henry from America with CC. Uh, that song is called Universe. The second song is Die Wings from Korea. I love this song right now, especially because of the slanders. And this song was written for slanders. The song is called Flow. And last but not least, uh, we have Kumachung from Japan, a song for fathers featuring Rang Hee. All right. Oh, it's R-A. So I'm not sure who that is though. But uh, I think I know who it is, but I, I think, I think, but I think, but I may not. But either way, that song is called A Song for Father. So everyone, please enjoy and make sure as you're praying each and every day, you put some prayers in for all these member artists from around the world. When I look at you, it's like I got the whole room on the tip of my finger and I'm pointing it right back to you. When I look at you, it's like I got the whole you, universe, the whole universe. That living could be easy So you taught me right from wrong Now I'm free to be Full of love, full of hope I'm empty of all things Now I'm living to make everyone come follow me This is a life worth living that I know If I love someone else, what would he give me though? It's like I'm floating on clouds, my feet don't touch the ground To the west, I'll follow behind you step by step Just like the stars above We shine and shine and look at the world In my hands in the universe is my name It's yours, can't escape from your love, it's yours It's yours, can't escape from your love, it's yours Just like the stars above We shine and shine and look at the world In my hands in the universe is my name It's yours, can't escape from your love, it's yours It's yours, can't escape from your love, it's yours 
And that was Kumachang from Japan with the song Song for Fathers featuring R.A. Uh, before that, Dai Wings from Korea with the song Flow. And of course, featured artist of the day. That's Mariah Henry from America with the song Universe featuring CC. All right, so let's get into some news going on around the world. What has happened over the last 24 hours? And of course, as the responsibility of all, as brides of this history, if we need to really pray for all the things that are happening, the terrible things, uh, not only just for Sunseam and the situation or in our families or for, or for ourselves. We've got to pray for everything as God listens to the prayer of the righteous. So uh, three reasons why we listen to the current news, why the world news is so important to us. Number one is um, we need to see what we need to report and pray for to see what God is doing. And last but not least, we need to comfort God's heart in those terrible things that are happening too. So let's begin first with Russia and the Ukraine. So we heard yesterday that the Crimea Bridge, uh, there was an explosion there and Putin accuses Ukraine of terrorism. Russian President Vladimir Putin has accused Ukraine of attacking the bridge to Russian annexed Crimea, saying that it was an act of terrorism. President Putin said Ukraine's intelligence forces had aimed to destroy a critically important piece of Russia's civil infrastructure he was speaking at a meeting with the head of the investigative committee of Russia, Alexander Bostrikin. Officials say three people were killed in the blast on the bridge. The victims were in a nearby car when a lorry blew up, Russian officials say. There is no doubt this is an act of terrorism aimed at destroying Russia's critical civilian infrastructure, Putin said. Its authors, perpetrators, and beneficiaries are the security services of Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Bastrikin said that citizens of Russia and some foreign states had aided preparations for the attack. And according to Mr. Bastrikin, investigators have established that the truck which they saw blew up traveled through Bulgaria, Georgia, Armenia, North Ossetia, and Krasnodar territory. And he has ordered an investigation into the incident which brought down sections of the roadway. Ukrainian officials have not indicated that their forces were behind the attack, but an advisor to Ukraine's President Zelensky uh, denied Putin's accusation. He wrote that there is only one terrorist state here and that the whole world knows who it is. Uh, and then on the other side, they said, does Putin accuse Ukraine of terrorism? It looks too cynical even for Russia. And on Saturday, uh, President Zelensky acknowledged the incident in his nightly address saying, today was not a bad day and mostly sunny on our state's territory. Unfortunately, it was cloudy in Crimea, although it was also warm, he added. So 
that's quite interesting how they would, you know, Zelensky would bring that up too, kind of hinting towards that also. Uh, on, on another front, uh, Ru- there was a Russian, un- a Russian attack on city claimed by Moscow, which killed 13 people. At least 13 people have been killed by Russian missile strikes on the southeastern city of Zaporozhye, Ukrainian officials say. Dozens more were wounded and several residential buildings destroyed. The city is under Ukrainian control, but it is part of a region that Russia says is uh, next last month. Zaporozhye has been hit repeatedly in recent weeks as Russia hits back at urban areas after suffering defeats in the south and northeast of Ukraine. Parts of the Zaporozhye region, including its nuclear power plant, which is around 52 kilometers from the city, have been under Russian control since early in the invasion. Ukrainian officials initially put the death toll at 17, but later revised it down. And um, BBC was there at the time who was um, there was Paul Adams from the BBC who was recently in the city says the building struck are not obvious military targets and the attacks seem entirely indiscriminate more than 60 civilians are understood to have been killed in and around Zaporozhye in the past nine days so that's kind of what's happening over there in Russia and the Ukraine so let's move over to Venezuela so deadly landslides sweep away homes in Venezuela uh, this is in Las Tajerias city, south of the capital Caracas. So at least 22 people have been reported dead and a further 52 are missing after the torrential rainfall caused by La Nina weathered pattern. Vice President Delcy Rodriguez visited one of the worst affected areas on Sunday. Rescue services are working to find those still missing, she said. President Nicolas Maduro described the situation as difficult and painful. About a thousand emergency personnel were taking part in search and rescue operations. Deputy Civil Protection Minister Carlos Perez Ampueda added. The landslides happened after the El Pato River burst its, uh, burst its banks and the resulting flood water swept away several houses and shops. Las Tejerias, which is some 67 kilometers from Caracas, uh, has been hit the hardest in Venezuela by this year's La Nina weather pattern. La Nina is a naturally occurring event which involves a cooling of the Pacific Ocean and usually brings wetter conditions to Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So prayers go out to all um, the people who have been affected by the landslides over there in Venezuela. Last but not least, we're going to go into Taiwan. So uh, news is out that defiant Taiwan's identity is moving away from China. So Taiwan today is marking double 10 or 10 uh, October 10th, the self-ruled island's national day. The annual celebration is especially significant this year. Um, tensions with Beijing, which claims Taiwan as its territory, are at an all-time high, and China's leader, Xi Jinping, who has been particularly vocal about reunification, is set to get a third term at a historic Communist Party meeting next week. Ironically, October 10th has nothing to do with Taiwan or any moment in its history. It, in fact, marks the day in 1911 when an uprising began in Wuchang in central China that eventually led to the collapse of the last imperial dynasty and the establishment of the Republic of China. So why is Taiwan celebrating the day? Because the island's official name is still the Republic of China on Taiwan. The flags flying across Taipei today are still of the white star on a blue and red uh, background. It's a peculiar legacy of the Chinese Civil War in 1949. Uh, The defeated nationalist regime of Chiang Kai-shek fled across the Taiwan Taiwan Strait to Taipei. And for decades, Chiang held Taiwan in an iron grip while continuing to proclaim his region the true democratic government of free China. Now, opinion polls this year suggest that 70 to 80 percent of people uh, in Taiwan now consider themselves Taiwanese. And that is a significant increase from a decade ago when around half the population still said they were Chinese. Now, this trend has not gone gone unnoticed in Beijing and and it is retaliating. China is a massive market for Taiwan, particularly for its food industry. Drive along the southwest coast just south of Tainan, and it's hard to tell where the land ends and the sea begins. Vast areas of farmland have been turned into huge saltwater ponds. It's not pretty, but beneath the surface of the muddy ponds lies treasure. It's a hard transition. Like Europe's dependence on Russian gas, Taiwan's over-reliance on China's vast market has made it vulnerable. But if Beijing thought economic pressure on Taiwan would work, it appears to have backfired. Around half of the island's population now supports formal independence, even under threat of attack from China. A poll last year showed 75% of Taiwanese say they would fight a Chinese invasion. And this growing sense of identity is accompanied by a growing sense of pride 
in Taiwan's own story uh, of its hard-won democracy and its remarkable transformation into one of Asia's most open societies. To them, the threat from China is not just a threat to Taiwan's political leadership, it's a threat to all the rights and freedoms its people enjoy. Over the last three decades, they have created something rather extraordinary here. It is something they can justly and proudly celebrate today, and it's something they have no intention of giving up, whatever the threats from Beijing. So that's a big, uh, it's huge for Taiwan, actually, when you think about uh, Taiwan province is like the second or third largest province country in the world right now. They are just doing an amazing and awesome job. I've worked with some of the Taiwanese people and they are really amazing. So super excited about that. Uh, so congratulations to Taiwan. And, you know, it's, it's basically the numbers of people feeling they're Taiwanese are going to keep going up because a lot of the people, remember, were born in China and came over to Taiwan or they had their roots in China, which means that as time goes on, they're going to die off and it's all going to be people born in Taiwan. And, and there's probably going to come a point where that number is going to reach like 95%, probably over 90% are going to feel that they're Taiwanese and not Chinese, right? So it's, it's quite, uh, quite, I think it's quite interesting, amazing, and it's a testament um, to providence, how they have run so hard and they've been blessed by God. And uh, they, you know... It's interesting how they're so protected by the U.S. Like, they're so protected. It's kind of crazy how protected they are. But they are very much protected. And, you know, that's why uh, China is... They can't even go full in right now because America's right there. They're selling weapons to Taiwan. And they're they're there in the Taiwan Strait. So uh, it looks like America is taking a very, very heavy stance in protecting them. All right? So now that the, the world news is done, let's get to some sporting news. What's happening around the world in sports? We'll start off with the NFL. And there's some big games that happened in their day. Uh, the Giants defeat the Green Bay Packers over there in London. Giants are now 4-1, and one, which was very, very unexpected. New England Patriots destroy the Detroit Lions 29-0. Buffalo, no problem, defeats the Pittsburgh uh, Steelers 38-3 in Kenny Pickett's first start uh, as a rookie. Yeah, but he's threw for over 300 yards, but... It's a good first game and a good way to learn. Uh, the Jets, surprisingly, are defeat the Miami Dolphins 40-17. to Tampa Bay controversially defeats Atlanta Falcons 21-15. to They're now sitting at 3-2. and New Orleans Saints defeat the Seattle Seahawks 39-32. Houston Texans with their first win of the season beat the Jacksonville Jaguars 13-6. Tennessee with their first win. They defeat Washington 21-17. Minnesota defeats Chicago 29-22. Uh, the LA Chargers... Oh, that was a tough game to watch. 30-28 over the Cleveland Browns, but a uh, big high-risk move they made just uh, with like only a minute left. San Francisco defeats Carolina 37-15. Dallas, surprisingly, 4-1 now with their backup quarterback, 22-10 over the LA Rams, the, the reigning Super Bowl champions. And then Philadelphia Phillies remain as the only undefeated team in the league with a 20-17 win over Arizona. Uh, and in the Sunday night football game, Baltimore beat Cincinnati 19-17 on a last-second field goal. Uh, in Major League play, uh, Baseball playoffs, uh, final game, wildcard game is done. Wildcard playoff seed is done. It is San Diego Pod uh, Padres defeating the New York Mets 6-0, and they advance to the National League Divisional Series. Uh, in soccer news, EPL, Arsenal defeats Liverpool 3-2, and they return to the top of the EPL standings. Man U defeats Everton 2-1. Ronaldo scores his 700th club goal. Uh, in Spain, Barcelona defeats Celta Vigo 1-0. All right? So there it is, guys. That is the top news in sports and world news. So you know what that means. It is the golden time. Yes, it is the golden time, a time of praise and worship to the Holy Trinity. I hope all of you guys are looking forward to giving glory to God and the Holy Spirit. So, what are we going to praise and worship today? We're going to start off with Flute of Truth, and then we have fulfilled the purpose of love, and we'll end things off with What Faith Has Given Me. So, as one body of the Morning Star Drive, let's spend this time giving praise, honor, and glory to the Holy Trinity.
was What Faith Has Given Me. Before that, We Have Fulfilled the Purpose of Love. And of course, that first song, Flute of Truth. So now that our hearts are made ready, uh, let's get into today's word study. And of course, every single Tuesday, back into our regular schedule, uh, we have the practical word study for this week. And um, these messages over the last two months, they're not easy ones to just take and put it into, you know, make it a practical word study. Uh, but there were a couple things that I wanted to bring up from uh, the Sunday message and things that we can do to help us to realize more. Now, one of the points that I thought that was very important, especially over the last couple of weeks, is about if you want to realize about the Word, the Word is so important, it's the words of God, but to realize about the Word, we need to realize about Jesus more, okay? So it's kind of like, well, what does it mean I need to realize? How am I going to realize about Jesus more? Is this all prayer? Is this like, what does this mean? And of course, you have the basic stuff like read the Gospels, right? You know, read the story of Jesus. That's one way you can get into, you know, to learn more about Jesus. There's one way. Another way is, you know, you can find older messages or Bible studies about Jesus, right? Or teaching about the Holy Son. So there's another way. But I think one of the biggest, like one way that I do think is a very, very good way to do it. And I, I was listening to one of my friends who was telling me that they just finished watching uh, Passion of the Christ, that movie, right? And one of the ways that you can learn more about Jesus and what his lifestyle, what his life was like, uh, watch movies, watch programs or document, uh, documentaries on Jesus. And one of them, I would definitely say I've only watched once in my life because it was that emotional, which is Passion of the Christ. It is so intense. And you'll get to realize um, the deep shimjung of the Lord when you watch that movie. But Passion of the Christ, go ahead, take a look at that one. It's super intense. You'll get uh, realize more deeply about the shimjung of Jesus, right? Uh, there's a bunch of other Jesus movies out there. You can go up on YouTube, check out some documentaries on Jesus, study about, look at some other people's commentar commentaries of what Jesus has um, did in his lifetime. And I think this is one of the one of the ways that you could this week just take out two hours of your time and go watch one of these movies, right? Go watch a documentary. And I would uh, the one I do uh, recommend is Passion of the Christ. If you've never seen or know much about Jesus and what he went through, go ahead and watch that movie, The Passion, right? And when you see this, you'll be like, oh my, people, you you can't watch that and not be the same. You can't. It's, it's just so intense. But if you guys want to know more about Jesus, realize more about him, then you'll realize how uh, even more deeply uh, how great the word is. And of course, with all these things that we're trying to do to make this more practical, whether you're watching a movie, a documentary, whether you're reading the Gospels, whether you're going to go to old Bible studies, whatever it is, um, make sure everything is wrapped up in prayer, right? So that you can always have the Holy Spirit leading you to realize the right things about what you're watching or what you're seeing or hearing uh, in, in this stuff too. So I really, really hope it's something that all of us can get our hearts and minds to really think about more deeply and realize that right now it's it's that time. It really is. And we have to, uh, in order for us to realize more about Jesus, we need to kind of know more about him. So read the Bible this week, read the Gospels. But a definite recommendation I give to you guys is watch one of the Jesus movies that have been out. And the one that I recommend uh, the most intense and most emotional is definitely Passion, the Passion, right? Passion of the Christ. And that is something I do think would be something more practical for to help you to learn and realize more deep. If you've seen it already, watch it again because it's so easy to lose the intensity of that movie too. Uh, the second thing I, would, I, I think that we can do to make this week's message more practical, uh, one of the things it talks about is in order for us to make the ideal world, in order for us to be raptured, we need to love the Holy Trinity and Jesus, right? And this is also very conceptual because it's a very spiritual thing. And people are going to say, oh, pray and pray and put the words into action, right? And of course, that's something that we hear all the time. However, when it comes to loving someone, right? Loving an entity, like loving like God, Holy Spirit, Holy Son, Jesus, they're all spiritual beings. So how do we love them more? And uh, in order to make this really real, just think about relationships in your life, right? When you have relationships, what makes you get closer to each other? It's actually spending time together. And something very practical you can do is set some time aside, schedule some time, uh, schedule a time during the day or during the week where you can spend time with the Holy Trinity and with Jesus. And what does that mean? Let me give you an example. Uh, for instance, um, set a time during the day after lunch where what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to a cafe I'm going, or I'm going to go on a small hike by myself. And I'm just going to talk to them. 
right? Talking to them could be multiple things. You could talk, you know, on a hike, it's very easy for me to talk out loud because I'm by myself. In a cafe, it's gonna, I'm gonna look crazy if I'm talking to myself. But uh, in a cafe, then it's better to write a letter, right, while you're there. And you're actually spending time with them talking about what's in your heart, what's in your mind. And in order for us to love them more, we need to spend that time together. And I tell you guys now, I've done my hikes, I've done my cafes, and when you spend that time only for them, whether it's even like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, sometimes I even go on a drive. I know it's, gas is really expensive these days, but I'll just go on a drive. Go on a drive, great view, and uh, on the radio, well, it's not the radio, I have like just um, calm music on, and I just talk out loud to God and the Holy Spirit. Right? I talk out loud to Jesus. I talk out loud to the Holy Son or Son's name. And I just talk out loud to them. And this is another way that you can spend, you know, to love the Holy Trinity and to Jesus is spending time together, right? And set that time. It doesn't have to be every single day for like 20 hours or anything else like that. Just set that time aside. You know, it doesn't have to be even an hour. You can do it for 20 minutes, right? And when you're doing something with it, like I'm going on a hike, it's 20 minutes is nothing. I, uh, for me, when I, when I go into the, to, to do a hike talking to God and the Holy Spirit and Holy Son and Jesus, when I'm just doing that, 40 minutes goes by so quick. When I'm driving, 40 minutes, no problem. Especially when the view is nice and you have like really serene music going on. That time goes by so quickly. Just spend that time together. You know, set that time aside. And that's something that you can do very practically when it comes to loving the Holy Trinity and, and the Lord, right? Uh, the last point that I want to make for the practical word study is another part that it was talked about is not just loving the Holy Trinity and Jesus, but it's also loving your brothers and sisters. And this is the same thing. Set time aside to spend time with your brothers and sisters. It could be physical, like your family, or people in the church. Uh, and I would say that, you know, during the time of the pandemic, people were suggesting set um, make sure to uh, check up on five people a day, Right? And not as a leader, not checking, did you go to pre-dawn, nothing, nothing like that. It's just see how things are going as a friend. You know, set, set aside, say, hey, every day I'm going to check on three people. Every day I'll check on five people. Every day I'm going to check on what, however many people you think would be good and healthy for you. Call them. Make sure they know you're there. And, uh, you know, spend that time together with your family. And I think that's another big important thing is every day, you know, get your three calls out. See how they're doing. Just check up on them, making sure they're okay. Um, when it comes to the Holy Trinity, set that time aside to spend together. 20, 30 minutes, go to a cafe, write write a letter to God, or go out a uh, small hike, go on a drive. Go Just, you know, do something alone where you can just spend that time without being distracted by anything else. Uh, and, of course, that first one is um, to get to know Jesus more. Yes, we need to pray, but on top of that, it's good to have more knowledge. Like the more you know, the more in-depth you know, the more you're going to be moved and inspired and you will be able to realize Jesus more. And then if you realize about Jesus, you'll realize about the word more deeply, right? And my suggestion would be, you know, spend that time, um, Passion of the Christ, watch that movie, any of those Jesus movies, YouTube documentaries on Jesus, whatever it is, read the Gospels or find an older Bible study you can watch again. But uh, definitely these are three things that I would say would be very practical for this week's uh, Sunday message. And you know, write in the comments below. Uh, if you watch, if you guys are going to watch The Passion of the Christ, tell me how it went. If you're going to, you know, uh, go out on a hike and just talk to the Holy Trinity, let me know. It would be awesome to see how you were affected by it or if it did make a difference in your life. Okay? So there it is, guys. That is a practical word study. I hope it's something that you guys can uh, think about more deeply. And yes, yeah, we can, we can actually do this, uh, putting the words into action each and every day. And uh, I'm really, really grateful and thankful for all of you out there that um, are supporting and making sure that this program is running more and more each and every day. All right. So there it is, guys. That is uh, the word study, the practical word study for today. Hope you guys really enjoyed that. Let's get into today's Japanese Tuesday. We're back on track in this schedule. And this song is from a group called Flow. I just found this group on uh, YouTube. And this song is called Niji no Sora. I have no idea what that means. So everyone out there, if uh, Japanese members out there, please let me know what this song is about. The group is called Flow, but the song is called Niji. 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 Ni is two. Each knee. 
G is that is that time two o'clock no Sora I I have no idea sorry forget about it I'm just trying to get into my old uh, Japanese what I did when I was in high school but I don't think um, I'm translating it properly so please uh, Japanese members out there please do not correct me I know I'm wrong <laughs> all right everyone please enjoy this is flow with Niji no Sora on this Japanese Tuesday <laughs> Niji no Sora from Flow over here on this Japanese Tuesday. Hope you guys really, really enjoyed that song. Just as I did. I love that song. So uh, I will be looking for more and more of these Japanese songs every single Tuesday. And of course, if you do have a recommendation, go ahead and leave it in the comments below. All right. So let's get into our final segment for today on this uh, on this Tuesday podcast. And of course, every Tuesday we have 
Pravi in the media. Now, today is very, very special because we have another amazing article from Massimo Introvigne, and I gave you kind of his uh, background uh, in the opening of today's uh, podcast. He is known in the world uh, for studies on new religions, right? And he's someone who uh, wants to get rid of discrimination, and he sees like there's so many uh, biases and things that governments or people have against cults or new religious movements and he's trying to battle against that and um, he has visited Wollongong he has learned the lessons not to become a member but to learn for scholarly study right because that's what his uh, that's what his major focus is on right religious liberty and human rights and this includes everyone and a lot of times people come in with these wrong thinkings or they come in thinking, or they come in with biases because, oh, I heard this is a cult, which is like not a very good word that people are going to, people are not going to use that word in a very good way, right? So let's get into, um, he has a five-part series called The Saga of Providence. And um, this is uh, this is number five. It's on Sunstein's trial and detention. And remember, this is coming from a scholarly point of view. It's not a positive for us or negative against us. It's just what he studied, what he saw, and how different it re- and what he you know what he wants people to know what the reality of uh, reality is of the situation. And this article came out actually last year, less than a year ago. Okay, so let me get into this article. Uh, the Saga of Providence, number five, President Jung's trial and detention. The movement's founder was sentenced to a 10-year prison term. His followers maintained he was innocent and kept the group alive and growing. An extremely active Christian anti-cult movement in South Korea exports to the international community its criticism of Christian new religious movements born in Korea because of its rapid growth and teachings believed to be heretical by South Koreans' mainline churches. Providence quickly became one of its main targets. So let me interject here. What he's basically saying is a lot of this is being pushed out by mainline churches in South Korea, right? And they're spreading it to the world because they believe that this is wrong. So this is why Providence quickly became one of its main targets. Back to the article. Although the main accusations against Providence concern sexual allegations, Providence has also been accused of dissimulation in its proselytization and of and of anti-Semitism. The first criticism is commonly directed against many, if not most, Korean Christian new religions, right? So not just Providence, it's most of these new Korean Christian religions, okay? And like other groups, Providence uses a variety of different names. While they may reflect different organizational models in different countries where the movement is active, there is little doubt that the name Providence is often avoided because of its media notoriety after the charges. As it happens with other Korean movements, this perpetuates a vicious cycle. The more Providence is attacked in the media, the more it tends to use other names when first inviting potential converts to its activities, which in turn results in more media criticism against its dissimulation strategies, right? So that makes sense, doesn't it? So let me interject here. Um, The vicious cycle is... There's so much bad media against the name Providence that we don't want to use it anymore. We use our own churches or whatever other names we use because it's so much, you know, it's so negative that people are going to have a, a, a negative view of it from the beginning. So we use different names, but then in turn, when the media finds out, then it becomes even more negative. like, oh, why are you hiding yourselves and stuff? So it's just a really bad cycle. Back to the uh, article. In 2016, the Australian editor of the British tabloid Daily Mail reported that, according to one ex-member, Providence is anti-Semitic and the pastors praise Adolf Hitler in their teachings. Although it uh, it also mentioned that a spokesperson for the church firmly denied that this was the case, my perusal of the writings, sermons, and messages of Jung did not find any reference to Hitler. I did find, however, references to the Jews being punished for the persecution of Jesus and the first Christians, but the punishment came in the shape of the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in 70 AD. The theme is still common in Providence, but is a common interpretation in conservative Protestantism of Luke chapter 21, verse 5 and 6, where Jesus predicts that the Jerusalem temple will be destroyed. 
right? So I'm interjecting again and basically saying that, yeah, we do say this about the, you know, that the Jews are being punished. However, is not uncommon. Even uh, more uh, conservative pr Protestant churches are saying the same thing. So it's not uncommon. Back to the article. While thousands of college students are familiar with Providence, mostly because of its student clubs and on-campus activities, the public opinion in South Korea and some other countries only knows the movement because of the high-profile trial of President Jung and his sentencing. After the media campaigns of 1999, Jung left South Korea for his world tour, but his enemies pursued him abroad, and he was also investigated in other countries such as Japan, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. An anti-cult organization called Exodus was formed to actively oppose Providence and it organized press conferences in South Korea and abroad where masked women appeared and told how they had been molested by Jung. On May 1st, 2007, following a request by Korean, uh, South Korean authorities, Jung was arrested in Anshan, China. He had to return to South Korea in February 2008 According to his lawyers, after complying voluntarily with the summons by the South Korean authorities, rather than as a result of a formal extradition by China. So this is this holds true. I'm interjecting now. Um, this holds true that, yeah, there was no extradition. Like South Korea was not demanding and China uh, complies to them and says, OK, we'll send him back to you. No, Sun Tzu had a choice. There was nothing. There, there wasn't this extradition thing that was going on. Sun Tzu voluntarily went back to face them. Back to the article. On August 12, 2008, the Seoul Central District Court sentenced Jung to six years in prison on three counts of rape. As usual in South Korea, in cult cases, he was also sentenced for embezzling money belonging to the movement, although the distinction between the funds of Providence and the private funds of Jung was not easy to establish. On February 10th, 2009, the Seoul High Court overturned the part of the first degree decision that had recognized Jung not guilty of a fourth count of rape and sentenced Jung to a total of 10 years in prison. On September 24th, 2009, the South Korean Supreme Court upheld the Seoul High Court verdict and Jung remained in prison until February 18th, 2018, when he ended serving his term. There are three irreconcilable narratives about the charges of sexual abuse. The court's narrative is that four South Korean women were sexually molested by Jung in countries other than South Korea after 1999. The decision did not take a position on whether sexual initiations were practiced or not within Providence, but regarded the woman as believable and the context of a cult where members were psychologically manipulated by the leader reinforced the judge's opinion. Okay, so I'll interject here. Is uh, the, the, the Well, we'll get into a little bit further why there is um, the decision did not take a position on whether sexual initiations, like, you know, does Providence have initiation in a sexual way? And there's nothing was talked about in there. But they basically regarded the woman as believable and the context of a cult where members are psychologically manipulated, right? So those are the two things. They believe the woman, number one, and number two is they believe that uh, they were psychologically manipulated, right? So go back into the article. In fact, the Korean Criminal Act distinguishes between three different crimes. There's rape, sexual assault, and quasi-rape, and quasi-sexual assault. So the latter, the quasi, what are these quasi ones? The latter section refers to cases where the perpetrator takes advantage of the victim's condition of unconsciousness or inability to resist. So in Jung's case, all victims, um, which uh, will be designated with letters for the sake of privacy, were Korean women, and there was A, B, C, D, and then uh, A and B claimed to have been molested in Hong Kong, C and D in Anshan City, China, and E was in Malaysia. So in the case of A and B, which is in uh, which which is in Hong Kong, Jung was found innocent of rape as the court did not believe there had been violence or intimidation, but guilty of sexual assault in the form of unsolicited indecent touching and of quasi rape because although not physically coerced or threatened, A and B psychologically were in a state of inability to resist. So that's why they they sided with them. C eventually became a main public voice for the anti-cult association Exodus. D eventually withdrew her accusation. That's the one we know. D eventually withdrew her accusation and even said that C was lying, right? 
So D eventually withdrew her accusation, saying she had been coached by C to lie. C was a forceful accuser at trial, and the judges believed her claim that she had been physically raped while taking a shower. The defense argued that C was a martial arts champion and could have easily resisted a short 61-year-old man, but her testimony stood. In the case of E, the judges of the lower court found Jung innocent of all charges, concluding that from E's own testimony, no violence or threat had emerged. The appeal court, however, reversed the decision and argued that since E thought that Jung was Jesus, she was in a status of inability to resist and Jung was found guilty of quasi-sexual assault. The defense also argued that the accusers had participated in camps organized by Exodus where they had been indoctrinated by the anti-cultists. This was regarded as true but not relevant by the first degree and appellate courts. Indeed, the question whether a woman who believes that her male spiritual leader has a special divine mission is, for this reason, in a condition of inability to resist sexual advances by him, has been frequently discussed in cult cases. The positive answer involves the usual accusations of brainwashing and mind control, which would allow the conclusion that a quasi-sexual abuse occurred even in a consensual event, where the consensus was allegedly created through mental manipulation. According to the court, this was a case for A.B. and, in the appellate case, E., while C. successfully alleged full-blown rape. So there is a second narrative common in... So this is a very... I'm going to interject here. This is a very common... So I really like this because he's just talking about what actually happened, right? But he also talks about narratives. And this second narrative is very interesting. So let's go back into the article about the second narrative. The second narrative, common in South Korea... Korean and other media claiming that the four cases for which Jung was sentenced were just the tip of the iceberg and many other women allegedly went through initiations that involved the sexual element. Apart from the legal qualification of what allegedly happened in these initiations as consensual or otherwise in several cases, South Korean courts found these accusations excessive including when Jung was serving, in, serving his term in prison. So Providence won lawsuits against different Korean media as courts allowed details of the trial to be published, but still regarded generalizations and allegations about hundreds or thousands of alleged sexual abuse cases as defamatory. They also found that in some cases, the media had doctored photographs and audio recordings of Jung to make them appear more sinister or incriminating than they, than, than they in fact were. While Providence did not win all its defamation cases, it did win several of them, and some journalists and media had to publish apologies. Right? So that's the second narrative is, guess what? There was like, these people are, are saying things that are lies. Like, they're not allowed to say them. They won those cases because they're saying, oh, this is, this is just the tip of the iceberg, and there's thousands of more women like this. And, the ans and basically the court said, no, that's not true. They can't publish those things, and people had to write uh, their apologies. So let's go into the third narrative. The third narrative, which is passionately believed by members of Providence, is that a, a cobble of slanders and anti-cultists created the whole legend of the sexual initiations and that these never happened. According to this narrative, the anti-cultists found some vindictive ex-members and women whose main purpose was to extract money from junk. This led to the trial and the convictions which happened in a South Korean cultural climate where somebody branded by the media and the powerful mainline churches as a cult leader could not expect to be treated fairly by the judges. President Jung himself has always denied all charges. Now, Providence also claims that some pictures of female members of Providence in sexy dresses, admittedly not common in Christian movements, published by opponents derived from the fact that among the ancillary activities they organize, there are fashion shows. Opponents also use a video of a Christmas performance in 2003 attended by Jung, where two female members during a dance lifted their costumes showing nude color underwear. Providence answers that the behavior of the girls was jocular but inappropriate and that the video shows a perplexed rather than approving Jung. Another video of 2003 shows Jung talking with young women in swimming suits inside a mosquito net near a swimming pool in Hong Kong. Providence insists nothing inappropriate happened except that opponents illegally entered a private home to film Jung. 
Apart from these petty details, outside observers obviously cannot determine which narrative is true. Although, I may add uh, three general comments. The first is that most, if not all, Korean Christian new religious movements come from a common matrix, the so-called Jesus Churches, a cluster of Christian, Kore uh, Christian Korean new religious movements, including the Holy Land Church, the Inside Belly Church, the Israel Monastery, and the Wilderness Church. These movements became notorious for their practices of uh, a blood exchange between the leader and the followers involving, at least in some cases, sexual intercourse. Both Reverend Moon of the Unification Church and Elder Pak Tae Sun, the founder of the Olive Tree Movement, which is at the origin of a whole lineage of Korean Christian new religions, had contacts with the Jesus churches and were accused of practicing uh, these blood exchange, uh, blood exchange, uh, blood exchanges between the leader and the followers, right? Uh, but because of these precedents, it became a matter of course for Korean anti-cultists and mainline churches to accuse all heretic movements of performing sexual initiations. So what Massimo is saying here is people are not going to know, like people are just listening to two narratives. One side is from Providence. One side is from the, the media, the anti-cultists. And people will not be able to figure out which one is true. But what he does bring up is that uh, he says that one of the things that are happening in Korea is because there are a lot of these different types of churches and some of them in the past that had what you call these blood exchange uh, rituals between the leader and the followers and some were sexual, right? It becomes something that is very, very easy. Because of this precedent, it became a, easy for Korean anti-cultists and mainline churches to accuse all heretic movements of performing sexual initiations. The second thing that Massimo brings up is this. Go back to the article. Providence's membership consists mostly of college students. There is a majority of female students, although a good 40% consists of males. The women are undistinguishable in their dressing style from the average college student in their respective countries, a style that is far away from the conservative habits of most mainline South Korean Protestant churches. What would be regarded as normal in a college party may easily appear as scandalous to conservative South Korean pro uh, Protestants, right? So another point that Massimo brings up is uh, these, like in Providence, it's not like we have these rules where you have to wear pants or a long dress. No make, you know, like where it gets very, very, um, like, like say conservative. And he says, no, we dress like normal people. And because we do, if you go to a college party and if you just dress like a, like you're going to a college party, it can appear scandalous to conservative South Korean Protestants. So that's why it looks very bad from the Korean perspective when it comes to like the, the conservative Protestants. So that's another good point that Massimo makes. And the third point that Massimo makes is, and there's a last part of the article, which is, Providence teaches that there is a relation between internal spiritual beauty and external beauty. Although spiritual beauty, not easily visible to human eyes, is more important, external beauty is a metaphor and a symbol of internal beauty. So accordingly, in the visual and performing arts of Providence, there is no trace of puritanical restraint about the human body and fashion. Both traditional Korean and modern westernized is regarded as a valid form of art and culture. While these elements may help in understanding the context, the conflict between Providence members' firm belief in their founders' innocence and the different narrative emerging from court decision and prevailing in most Korean media remains unreconcilable, right? So last point is a good point too is we believe both in the inner beauty and outer beauty and we're not just looking at traditional Korean wear for like when it comes to uh, fashion, right? We look at both Kore traditional Korean and modern westernized. And as both are valid forms of art and culture. And it's going to be very, very different from what uh, more conservative Christian and mainline churches believe. And that's, that's, that's where more misunderstandings can come out. Because if they're much more on the conservative side and then they see Providence girls wearing some more westernized, it could be uh, the gap is much bigger and they'll look at it in a much worse way right? But one thing is true, he says is, 
These different narratives emerging from court decisions and prevailing in most Korean media uh, media and Providence members' firth, firm beliefs, it makes the two narratives of both of these uh, opposite sides irreconcilable and it's very, very difficult for people on the outside to see the difference between the two. And I think that this is a very, very... Gr I really think that this is a, um, a very good article and explains more in... It gives you context of where, you know, why are they wearing a bathing suit? Because it's a fashion show, right? And But, but then if you're a conservative Christian in Korea, there's no way you're going to have a fashion show. Or the way you dress makes a big difference. It's much, much more conservative. But then in Providence, we're very open to all art forms, right? All art and culture is, is, is a, you know, you can express it in many different ways, whether it's westernized or whether it's conservative Korean, right? And the, all this context comes into it and it's not telling you one side is better than the other. It's just giving you context and get, telling you this is what happened during that time. And this is what we need to realize even more. And I thought that was very, very good the way that he put it. I'll, I'll post this into um, the. I'll, I'll post this article also into the uh, the description below too, so you guys can take a look at it yourself. But yeah, take a look at Massimo Introvigne. Take a look at his um, like like I said. Take a look at his resume. He is not someone coming in to take sides. He's looking at very scholarly more than anything else. So I hope this is something that uh, that helped you guys out a lot it helped me a lot just to read this looking at some of the other facts that i didn't even know about the trials and stuff like that too and i hope it's something that you guys uh will be able to kind of uh digest it understand it and see from different perspectives and angles when people look at us too all right so there it is guys that is probably in the media hope you guys really enjoyed that have an amazing and awesome tuesday and we'll see you guys tomorrow on the morning star drive on 117.8 the morning star drive on 17.8 You saw up with sky, now's the time, don't delay I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind I'm burning with desire and the passion